All right, welcome to the Erie Music History Podcast. I'm Chip Shell, your host. And my guest today is someone who is not from Erie originally, although he moved here when he was 10 years old in 1965, stayed till about 1975, and then he moved to Washington, D.C., where he's calling in from today. He is known as a pianist and composer of both jazz and classical music. He's performed with many jazz artists, such as Woody Shaw, Chris Potter, Dave Liebman, and Dizzy Gillespie. He's performed extensively with the National Symphony Orchestra, the Baltimore Symphony, and the 20th Century Consort, and he is active as a composer of both classical music and film music with hundreds of film and TV scores to his name. Now, if you don't believe me, you can check out his Wikipedia page. Uh, so with that long intro, welcome to the podcast, Dave Kane. Thank you very much, Chip. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. And you had reached out to me on Facebook and said, hey, I got a few stories to tell. And I did not know who you were. And so I said, OK, well, you know, I only interview people that were playing back in Erie in those days. And you said, well, I've, I've played with, you know, Art Phillips, who's been on the podcast, Ron Seggi, who's been on the podcast, Rick Cass, Durf Hopsager, Jack Todd, Dan McNamara. You played in the yeah. funky Stygian Hue movement, man. I mean, uh. I'm amazed. Does, does anybody remember that name? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Last the last episode that I had with Scott Campbell, um, Scott played in that band after you had left. He played oh, at really? the very end of it. So it's not a band that you hear a lot. The Funky Stitch no. and Hugh movement, but uh, oh, it was a great band. Yeah, they great were, name. Uh, inspired by uh, the Ohio Players, I guess. Uh, do you know who Frank Williams is? I don't. Yeah, Frank might be, well, he's getting on in years now, but he might be, uh, and he's retired, but he might be somebody to talk to because uh, he was uh, he was a teacher at Academy. I don't believe he taught music. I think he taught English, oh, okay. but uh, he was a real, he was a real pistol, real fiery, go get him kind of guy. And he put this band together after hearing Ohio players. So we can do that too. And uh, and the band was really great. There was we had a guy on bass. His name was Richard Nixon. Yeah. And uh, but it was N I C K S O N. Yep. And uh, he ended up um, being bass player for Mandrill or War or, or maybe both of them. Yeah. Out yeah. the West Coast, and then he switched to guitar. And, and apparently, he had some kind of career out there. But uh, Richard was phenomenal. Uh, hmm. He was eye poppingly good uh, on the electric bass. And, and we should point out that Frank Williams was a trombonist, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Frank was so, a trombone. Yeah, yeah, like you yeah. said, like Earth, Wind, and Fire, Ohio Players, that type yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And we had uh, this band. I mean, it was, uh, well, there were three white kids. It was me, the drummer, and the organist. I was playing saxophone in the band at the time. Okay. And then the rest were all Afri African Americans. So we played like everywhere and some funky place. <laughs> Do you remember any of the other, I know Gary Venable was the drummer. Yeah, um, Gary moved to Washington along with me. Oh, okay. Uh, so we moved around the same time. Yeah, and uh, I forget the guy who played, I forget everybody actually. This is the problem, you interview a 60 year old, uh, old guy and some of the facts and names sure. are not quite there as they used to. i think brett clark may have been in that band i'm not sure uh I mean, at some point doesn't ring a bell, but there were there was a number of people played in it yeah after i left uh and i and that band made me regret because it was having so much fun playing with well let's let's back it up a bit then okay, and let's yeah, start yeah, you know you come to Erie from Glasgow, Scotland. You have zero accent, obviously, now. I mean, yeah. how did you, why did you even come here? Uh, well, it was a, I don't want to bore you with a long, uninteresting story. Essentially, uh, my dad was uh, dissatisfied with being in Scotland. Actually, my, my mom, a teacher in uh, Glasgow Municipal Schools, she found out she had been a Passover for a promotion. He was better uh, qualified because she was Catholic and mm. the school district was very much Protestant. I mean, that kind of discrimination, I don't know if it's still going on. I suspect it's a lot less now, but yeah. it was actually fairly uh, alive back then. I and mean, it wasn't quite the, the same level that you got in Belfast, the Catholics and the Protestants in there, but it was a lower level of the same sort of thing. So when I went to school, I used to have to choose my roots carefully so I didn't run into any Protestant kids. Yeah, we probably had to do the same thing to not run any Catholic kids because there would be rock throwing and potential violence and stuff. It was weird. Wow. So yeah. they, they got bugged with uh, life in the UK. My uncle already lived in Ian, so 
uh, we decided to immigrate, or my dad decided we were going to immigrate. Yeah. And since he was in the area, we came here. And, you know, it, it probably wasn't a terrible choice. You were 10 years old. You yeah. were already, you had played a little bit, right? Uh, what, piano or sax? Uh, I'd only played a little bit of piano. I mean, really none to speak of. Okay. Uh, so right. my mom was a piano teacher. But oh. it's just so often the case, she found it impossible to teach me. <laughs> so, oh, really? I was going to say, was she the main teacher for you, or did you end up taking lessons from other folks? I had to, I had to study with other folks. Uh, she taught me for, uh, I don't know, six months, and then decided that she, for whatever she couldn't handle it. Hmm. Uh, so she farmed me out. Uh, <laughs> and then I guess I started taking it up again after we moved to the States. We got a piano in the house. So hmm. and then, well, the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> did your mom teach you? Piano in Erie? Yeah, she did. She did for years. In fact, I left in 75, but she kept, she stayed until I think like the mid 80s. So I would actually mm -hmm. go back a couple of times and, and visit her. Oh, okay. But uh, she continued to teach for much of that time. Just as private lessons or did she work with someone else? She worked okay. private lessons, but she was also an accompanist. I don't know if you know this name, Ray Passanelli. I don't. Mm -mm. Um, Ray, yeah, he's actually an interesting part of uh, Erie music history. Uh, because uh, Ray, I, I don't know if the restaurant's still there, but it, his family had Passanelli's restaurant. But uh, there was, they were like a long, multi-generation Italian restaurant. But Ray had this, was blessed with this magnificent uh, operatic voice. So he went to school for opera, and he went to the University of Chicago, and, and he became a star. Mm. Uh, he joined the Chicago Metropolitan Opera, which is one of the best opera company in the country. And he was the leading tenor for a couple of things played under Fritz Reiner, who was a big conductor. In fact, I have uh, an old wire recording of him playing with the uh, singing with him. But unfortunately, uh, strong Italian families being what they are, his dad ordered him to come back, and join to help out at the restaurant. Sure. Yeah. So I guess his dad had died and they were shorthanded. Interesting. And they felt compelled to do that. And so he gave up this like super promising operatic career to go back to Erie now, but he continued to stay out active as a singer. And uh, he would always play the Messiah every year, Phil, and, and, hmm. and assorted things like that. Uh, and he was like well known at the time. He would just uh, he played for all kinds of prayer breakfasts. And, yeah. Uh, and literally people, people would ask him to sing Danny Boy. And, and you know, really, we definitely see tears in people's eyes. Wow! You, you could just get people to cry. It was amazing. Ray Passanelli, <laughs> that's his name. Yeah. Okay. I don't if anybody else right. uh, remember? Me. You know, this. I mean, your your uh, podcast is is more or less a feature of uh, like rock and, and right. that type of thing. So it's, it's probably unlikely that uh, you come across somebody who knows him. But he was uh, a known name at the time, up until I would say probably his health. Decline. Okay. But, All right. Uh, yeah, he was a fixture. That's cool. Possible. I mean, that way we have a little bit of a, uh, a sub episode within this episode. We've got a little yes. Ray Passanelli up part. And, and, you know, that kind of leads into one of the points that I was going to make is I don't have a lot of experience talking to folks that are in jazz or classical like you have. And I was just curious, you know, like we just mentioned the funky Stygian hue movement, which is yeah. clearly not either one of those genres, yeah. you know, um, when you're 10, you know, 11, you're taking lessons. Um, what type of music were you into? You know, because when I talked to Art Phillips, like he was very specific, like that Italian music was at my house. That's what I liked playing, you know, yeah. um, e even he wasn't saying I wanted to listen to, you know, Rush or whatever at the time. Right. Um, well, well, meeting Art was like a, a big uh, moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, the music, we were strictly classical at our house. Mm. I didn't even hear anything other than classical, except occasionally V. And, uh, you know, my parents probably should have kept the TV off because I heard I heard the modern jazz quartet uh, on some live tea show. And oh, that's cool. What is that? It's jazz. <laughs> Somehow that planted a seed. And uh, so I went from being a jazz, uh, classical snob where I just looked down my nose at anything that wasn't classical to be to being a jazz and classical snob where wow. I still looked down my nose at anything that wasn't jazz and classical. Fortunately, the rest of my life has been about shedding all of that. Mm. And, uh, and of course, actually, that started in Erie. Uh, you know, guys like Durf and Al Smith were playing me uh, music that I would never have been exposed to 
ordinarily. Um, Al turned me on to Gentle Giant and all that kind of like uh, prog rock that was happening. Oh. At the time. King Crimson. Okay. And yeah. uh, and it's and, and Durf is similarly. Uh, so uh, those guys really opened my eyes and, and made me realize just how stupid I was. <laughs> think that well, uh, well, on the opposite side of that coin, you know, Dan McNamara, someone else that you uh, played with and who has been on the episode, uh, I talked to Dan, I called him and said, hey, I'm going to, you know, um, be be inter interviewing Dave, you know, um, any comments? And he said, yeah, you know, among the many accolades that he he went on about you, he said that you turned him on to the Don Ellis Big Band and the <laughs> Tears of Joy album in particular. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's kind of the opposite. Like you were getting turned on to prog rock, and meanwhile you're turning, you know, Dan on to big band music. Is that how you would define um, Don Ellis? Uh, yeah, I guess. Although uh, Don Ellis really kind of stood alone apart from, you know, he was uh, an outlier as far as big band music goes because nobody was doing anything remotely. Still not really doing anything remotely. Like he was doing when you think of Ellington and Basie and Kenton and uh you know the other big bands at the time they you could see the affinity between them but you know uh ellis was doing stuff or, he was the one that turned me on to bulgarian music uh because mm -hmm. he had a bulgarian uh, piano player and they had a bulgarian chart that to play it, it just like electrified me it's like you don't duke ellington's not doing bulgarian music you know no. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure who is doing bulgarian music no, well, yeah nobody well i <laughs> am but uh... yeah especially uh you as a teenager in erie pennsylvania in night you know in the late 60s uh you know you eventually get in the band obviously um at prep but where did you yeah. go to school before that um i was at st james uh and did they have music programs and stuff for you there no or? there was nothing there <laughs> Okay. In fact, I got to say that, uh, uh, you know, my interest in music was, uh, it's, it's remarkable that it didn't get stifled because really I didn't get much help from any of the, the school stuff that I was involved with. Mm. You know, uh, you know, I heard Dan's podcast where he talked about Tony Savelli and he more or less had a, a, a kind, a kinder view of Tony than I did. <laughs> <laughs> and Tony Savelli was the teacher where? He was the band director at prep at prep. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And as far as I'm concerned, Tony was like really looking out for himself and trying to do kind of the minimum possible to keep his job. And he wasn't really interested in nurturing any talents in the band other than people that would pay to have take lessons. Oh, okay. So gotcha. When I was first in the band, I took lessons from him. I, and I actually, I should, I, I do credit Tony. Tony did team to read me time and not lose my place. And so, and that was a huge thing. Uh, before that, I was reading music, but you know, as a piano player, you, you're always playing by yourself. You don't have to synchronize with other musicians. So, mm. you know, as a consequence, I, I didn't realize what I was taking like huge liberties, really just giant mistakes in how I was playing just rhythmically. And then when I got with Tony, he straightened me out and mm. in short order. And so, yeah, I'm actually very grateful for that. But then our family didn't have a lot of money. I was first chair clarinet in the prep band. And uh, I told Tony, I said, Tony, I, I can't take lessons. And like the next day I came in and I'm second chair ah. <laughs> in the prep band. All right. The guy that was still studying with him was first chair. So anyway, he was a little bit like that. He told me that that he invented jazz, not those black guys. Actually, he referred to them as those colored guys. I mean, that was the, the late guys, 60s the generation he came from right back then. And you played uh, so you played clarinet and you play sax and, and piano. Yeah. And also, yeah and my, I mean, I don't do much of that anymore. I, I still do a little bit. Piano is. Really but in that band, you were playing what? Clarinet? I Actually, I, in in the prep band, I played a clarinet. I played saxophone in the jazz band. I played uh, glockenspiel in the marching <laughs> band. And when they were shorthanded, I also played alto horn. Uh, wow. Because, one, of the, one of the things that, you know, well, as I said, I didn't get any help from any, uh, you know, notably uh, Tony and, and Father Bible was the other guy who was mm -hmm. in prep. Uh, no, none of them, like, really helped me at all. But... I did have access to a whole room full of instruments. And so I learned to play them all. Oh, okay. Uh, which really ended up being very useful because you know, now uh, one of the things I do is orchestration. And from having learned to play all those instruments, badly, I might add, I'm not trying to pretend I was like some sort of <laughs> prodigy or anything, but I had a familiarity with the instruments that, that, that helped out. 
Well, I, I mean, the comments that I got from Mark Phillips and and um, and Dan both said that you know you were really acting as a composer at an early age in some of these projects that they were in. I mean, what is the next step from the prep band? I mean, do you have a first rock band or any type of band that you're in with your friends in high school? Uh, well, I was a member of the Ten Cylinders, uh, oh, which I probably didn't do enough to to register on your on your uh, uh, on my radar. Yeah, the uh, Ten Cylinders. Yeah, it was a greaser band. And we were okay. doing fifties fifties uh, stuff or doo wop, and I, I was doing that when I was in high school. Uh, again, I was I think I saw like saxophone. Yeah, yeah. So I was playing, you know, like a yakety sax kind of <laughs> solos, uh, real super greasy. Wow. <laughs> like 50s type of stuff. Yeah. And, and the band was around for, well, at least a year. I mean, I don't know what the average life of a band is. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. They're not that long. So, yeah, that was the first uh, probably organized band. But I, I was also playing, um, I was also playing saxophone, trumpet, piano, uh, Markham's Men of Music which was uh, Dale Higgins' big band. And he formed the band. Uh, we played like a lot of proms. Back then, you could have a big band for a prom. That was uh, kind of cool. Got it. <laughs> I don't think it's very cool anymore. Uh, and and so when you say Markham's Men of Music, is that like Markham's Music Store? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, Dale, I sent you his picture. And maybe, oh, right. I think actually Dan and maybe somebody else in Dale, the podcast, Dale, Dale was uh, one of the salesmen there at Markham. Okay. But he did have an interest. And yeah, I will say, you know, nobody really helped me in school as either prep, uh, but Dale helped me a lot. Mm. Uh, he used to have uh, an after school rehearsal band. And that's where I kind of met many of these guys through that. So, uh, you know, after a prep was, uh, was done, walk over there and an hour later we were rehearsing. I think we did it a couple of days. Uh, mm. I remember Sydney Wendy Wagner. Guy Groendahl and geez, I, I well, it was a big band. Those are the two names that, that come to mind immediately, anyway. But uh, you know, Cindy has gone on. She's a uh, music guy. She's now in Rochester, out in, in Northern California, mm. uh, and she's a, an accomplished a woodwind player, saxophone player, and piano player too. She's also very talented. Yeah, you know, you had even pointed that out. You said, is there something in the water in Erie? Because I ended up playing with a lot of very talented people that went on to make music, you know, as a career, like we've mentioned with uh, some of the folks already. Um, what was, yeah. I mean, at the time you were just jamming with some of these people. I mean, you were playing in the Markham's Men of Music. I mean, yeah. how does it transition to, I mean, the funky Stygian <laughs> uh, hue movement obviously is totally different than what we've talked about but right you know you also played like um well first of all we should say you graduated prep in 72 right that's right and the summer festival of the arts is a big thing back then i mean if yeah. you can get that gig um so tell that story because you guys were slated to play and tell the story of nothing yet yeah well <laughs> and it's still nothing yet yeah uh, well uh, you know, Dan probably remembers more of the details than I do, but I remember we were excited because I, I can't remember who managed to cure the invitation from the Erie Arts uh, people to perform. And we knew like two months out. So I wrote a bunch of charts and I think art did too. So we worked really hard and we, we practiced our asses off. We were killing. And uh, and then I guess it was a, was a hurricane. Rain? I don't remember. It was a lot of rain. Yeah. That yeah. year. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, they had to cancel the thing, and right. the, the last moment, it was like such a disappointment. We were all hepped up. This is going to be like the, it's going to be our big break, you know? Yeah, because uh, you hadn't, so it's you and Art Phillips, Scott Kuhn, who we were talking about a little earlier. Yeah. Um, so Scott's keyboard player, what were you playing? Um, I guess I was playing sax. Okay, and then Durf Hopsager is playing bass. Yeah, he was playing bass. Right. And, and, uh, and Guy Grondahl was playing trumpet. Okay. And Dan McNamara is on drums? Yeah, I believe so. That sounds like it. And and Dan was saying um, how to get that gig, like you said, you know, that you got in touch with the people from the Summer Festival of the Arts, you know, back then you had to either audition or, you know, submit something to them. And John Imms, who has been on the up on this podcast, you know, at mm -hmm. the time, he was one of the guys that was making those decisions. Oh, really? And, 
And Dan remembers that John came to the house where you guys were practicing to listen to oh, really? for that audition. And that's yeah, how you, you got remember it. remember that detail. Yeah. Well, I think David Greiger was also, he played trombone. And Dave's another guy, uh, very interesting. He was, uh, you know, just what you call it. He was a, well, I wouldn't say prodigy, but he was a, he was, he was advanced for his age. Okay. And he All was right. totally into trombone. And he went on to uh, to have a, a good career as a trombonist. He ended up in New York City where he was playing with the Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, or, mm. which was a premier big band in New York City. That they've got a thousand. And, uh, but then he just got bummed with the scene and decided he didn't want to be, he wanted to be a trombone player, but he didn't want to do the grind. So he, mm. he became a doctor. Oh, and, okay. Uh, well, different type of grind. Really? So, yeah, different kind. So at a, a really kind of uh, middle age, and, and he went through medical school, became a doctor, and he's now in Lenox, uh, Massachusetts. We stay in touch, and he's still playing. But a really talented guy. Yeah, interesting. I mean, there's been a lot of those types of guys that have come in and out of, you know, your musical uh, orbit um, over the years. And yeah. so the one thing that I'm confused about, though, is, you know, I know you and everybody seems to know you as a piano player, but we haven't talked about you playing in piano in any of these bands yet, right? I don't think I played piano in any bands. Really? Wow. I, uh, oh, I, I, yeah, actually, I played a little bit. So I would play clavinet with the funky and you. Okay. Uh, so that was the only keyboard I played. Chris clavinet was like the instrument of the time, especially for funk. After, right. Uh, uh, superstition after CD one. Oh yeah. Superstition. Everybody had to have a clavinet, including me, and I loved it. It was so much fun to play. Um, but then I, I remember doing a gig. It was right off of uh, the main square in Erie. Perry it? Square. Perry Square. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a, a little club there, and I remember playing some gigs there with Frank. May have been Dan and Durf or Louis Lumiere. Or, hmm. Is that a name that's come up at all? It is not. No. Uh, uh, Louis, I wish I could remember his last name. Probably somebody else that you've talked to yeah. here uh, would remember his. But he was actually a really good bass player. He may have played with Ron Seggi. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I was playing piano with Ron Seggi. Oh, true. you were? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that was probably the first regular uh, piano playing that I did. Yeah. yeah it's, cause... All, it's all a jumbo, man. It's hard to like. I, I bet. Yeah. I mean, we're out. talking 1972. That was a little while yeah. ago. And, <laughs> and you know, you graduated from uh, in 72. And then did you go to North Texas College or? I did. Right I mean, away? I or? Went, I only went there for a semester. Okay. Because uh, I got sick, and well, a combination. I got sick, my uh, money ran out, and my <laughs> parents got divorced. Uh, like all in the same, all in the same semester. I had to come back and, and help take care. So okay, gotcha. That was my college career, but really, you know, North Texas was at a nadir in terms of the quality of things that's happening. Uh, I don't want to get too too sidetracked. Yeah, it was an unsatisfying experience. Both Got it. Music. But the one thing that did happen when we were in Texas, I was I was a saxophone man, and and my my teacher said, you know, you're, you're one of the worst saxophone students I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> he was a jerk. His name was Jim Riggs, and he was famously hated by just about everybody. He would go to any practice room, and there would be some like scurrilous like. Jim's rig is a asshole, or you know, <laughs> or the walls, was everywhere. Uh, but but he had heard me play piano because I was playing piano. In, I was playing a saxophone in the four o'clock band and a piano in the five o'clock band. Hmm. And he had heard me play, and he goes, "Yeah, yeah, you should really stick to piano." <laughs> and, and I was like so discouraged by you know his uh, telling me it was funny. He he gave me like poor grades, but when I did my saxophone uh, juries for other two, I got higher grades. I think he just took a personal dislike to me. Okay. But, <laughs> but he did tell me to, to pursue the piano, and that's what I did. After that, I, I stopped. Well, I would, didn't stop playing. I, I toured with uh, the guy who did uh, L O V E, uh, mm. Polish, uh, Bobby Vinton. Bobby Vinton. So, yeah. The I Polish did, Prince. Yeah. I did some work with uh, Bobby Vinton in the area, we, New York and Ohio. Still, play, still playing saxophone, man. Uh, but that was probably like the last professional that I did on. I, I just started getting a lot of calls on just kind of the, the sax. So music, you became your career. I mean, you, you did you ever plan to do anything other than that? I mean, you even went to college for it. Well, <laughs> my uh, for some reason, despite me not trying very hard, 
Um, I got like a, a sky high of SAT score and, and nobody was more surprised than me because <laughs> I felt like I'd done really poorly. And, and as a matter of fact, I remember guessing on 30 of the last questions, like, <laughs> like just going, was like, well, this last one was A, so I'll put B here. It was that kind of thing. So somehow I think I got super lucky. And uh, so I ended up in the 99th percentile and on both my scores. I'm not trying to brag because I'm really, yeah. I think it was some sort of accident. Uh, but as a result, I, the, the only two schools I applied to were MIT or Texas. And we, may, mainly because we couldn't afford the application. Our family was in pretty dire straits financially mm. at that. So I could only afford the, uh, the application for two colleges. And I got accepted to both. And my, of course, my parents were ecstatic. Oh, you got into MIT. That's awesome. Yeah. And then I said, yeah, but I think, I think I'd rather be a musician. And it was like, oh God. So my dad literally did not talk to me for five years as a result of that. Wow. Uh, and uh, who's to say whether it was the right decision or not? I mean, I've been perfectly happy as a musician, but I don't right. know. I was attracted to science and stuff as well. Uh, and you've never had any other job, right? I've never had any job. Yeah. I've, you know, like you said, you, you started playing professionally young. I mean, uh, from 72 to 75, you're still in Erie. Am I right yeah. in saying you leave for Washington in 75? Yep. I, on my birthday. Okay. Birthday. So yeah. in, in between those years, I mean, you play with, like you said, you played with Ron Seggy for a while, right? Yeah. Uh, funky Stidge and Hugh movement, of course. Um, yeah. Ten Cylinders was a little bit earlier than that. Markham's right. Men of Music. Um, there is a picture of you playing in a band uh, with a female singer named Patty Short. Um, Patty that, Short. I couldn't remember her name. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, our friend uh, Christine Lorraine Morgan uh that yeah, Chris. She, she had posted that picture and um oh did she oh, okay and, yeah and you had commented on it on on facebook i think I you know and couldn't that. believe that you had even anybody dug that up and i've been trying to figure out what that <laughs> band was called um, yeah and i can't remember what it was called my uh, best guess my best guess is this band played at anthony's lounge a lot it was at um on east fifth street uh, 12 east fifth street and um okay. There was a band that played during that time period, 73, with Patty in it. Um, originally, it had Vinnie Younger in it, um, who was from the Epics, and Vinnie yeah. left. Um, but Patty was playing with them, and it was called Classic Rock. The band no. was called that. And then I they morphed into, oh, into Directory. They became Directory. Um, okay. It so been Directory. I, I, know, I definitely know it was Classic Rock. But I think what happened was another band came through Erie and somehow they lost their player and mm. their singer. And so we got recruited. They were doing a gig in Erie. Okay. I can't remember any of the details of that gig. On, but um, Well, that, we, that would track because Patty eventually marries a, a professional musician named Mike Redford. And his yeah, band was called... Yeah, he's the saxophone player in that picture. He's the guy with the, the, the uh, frizzy blonde hair. Extending. Oh, Okay. Hand, if I recall correctly. Okay. Well, his band was called Good Vibes later. Um, okay. And they went on to tour around the United States. Interestingly enough, he attended t North Texas State University. Yeah. Um, so maybe that was it. Maybe that was yeah, the and band. And he moved to D.C. He was part, right. of, the, he was part of the Airmen and Note. Yeah, right. So I actually met him later um, after we'd been in this band together. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It was a... The band was relatively short lived. It was only a couple of months. It was a nice, it was a good band. I, I, all the people were nice. You know, a lot of times, I mean, I'm sure you've had plenty of stories of people where e egos will blow up the band or other factors like that. It wasn't a factor with these guys. Uh, we were kind of slim on the bookings. So uh, I remember we did a gig in New York City and it was at some sort of like Polynesian lounge. Mm place and uh we show up and there's like clearly like a mafia kind of dude was running <laughs> the uh was running the club and he goes you guys you're gonna have to put on grass skirts you know that and it's like grass skirts what the f so it was like no we're not putting on grass skirts <laughs> so we, we just adamantly refused and he goes i'll give you 20 minutes to get out of here and you'll never work in new york city again and we believed him you know yeah. She just, he just looked like he just stepped off of the state, you know, the set of the Sopranos. Like, okay, we're <laughs> out of here. Uh, and then we, our next gig, in North Carolina, and, and it was in the same place that the original drummer from the, Stu Sutcliffe. No, he was Pete Best, was the original oh, drummer. Oh, his name was Pete Best. Yeah, yeah. 
well, it was one of those two guys. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was at, at their club. And then I don't remember much after that. We we did some gigs. Uh, we, we opened for uh, the chick who sang uh, M- McGovern, uh, Midnight at the Oasis. Sure, right, yep. yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, that was in New York someplace. Yeah, so we, we, we were kind of like running all over the place, but somehow the bookings weren't sustained enough. And, and this we, is the band with Patty, Patty Shore. Yeah, it's the band with oh, Patty. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So you toured around for a little while. I mean, bef- and that was before you went to D.C., uh yes well actually yeah that was just before i went to yeah so what leads you to dc how do you why why did you pick that well i was working part-time at the record bar Mm. and uh and this guy my roommate now why do i remember it'll come oh stan mark stan mark was i guess the maynard ferguson okay stan was the lead trumpet player for ferguson and stan he was on the road nearly all year but uh but he kept a room in washington at, at, along with some roommates one of his roommates was this guy named al music you know and hmm. al had a band and he told stan he goes i'm desperate for a keyboard player my keyboard player quit on the first set that i hired him and uh you, you know if you know any keyboard players so uh you know at this point i think i was like tired of the eerie or something or i, I probably wasn't as much tired of eerie as just wanting to see the, the greater world because yeah right i think about it there was, you know, there was, this will be backtracking, but there was a lot going on in Erie, surprising the time. But anyway, I did just to finish the story. So, yeah. so he said, yeah, there's this guy down and he's looking for a keyboard player. You'd have to drive the 350 miles down to audition. And I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I drove the 350 miles. I played his set and he hired me on the spot and I moved in with him and actually took Stan's, uh, and, and that's and I've been there ever since. And never came back. Yeah, never, yeah. Well, I, I came back for my mom, you know, a couple of times a year. I said, but the, no, no musical reason. Right, so, right. Like I said, I, I I did regret leaving the Funky Sin Hugh. The band was just such a gas to play with it. And Frank was uh, he was getting bookings. We were working pretty steadily. So yeah. Do you remember some of the places that band played? Cool. I mean, uh, I know that you played. Okay, I'll let you. Yeah. I do not. We did a lot of out of town. work. You did. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I remember being in Buffalo. And, uh, mm. The Sportsman is the only place that I remember. <laughs> I mean, it's probably not there anymore. It was, yeah, that was a. Uh, well, like we, you... we played a lot of places, but mainly black clubs, which was cool for me because at that time, you know, I just discovered black music. You know, basically, like a lot of white kids at the time was like, I wanted to be black. You know. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Uh, because, you know, once I discovered funk, it's like, wow, yeah, this music really moved me in a way that I hadn't previously. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it sounds like that band was so different than all the other things that you had done. And, you know, uh, I think one of the guys had noted that you played at a little bar at 12th and Powell in West Mill Creek. It's still there. It used to be called the Poet and the Peasant. Yeah, that was actually Ray's club, Ray, uh, Ray Passanelli, the guy I was telling you. Ah, okay. He bought the club because basically he was kind of looking for, well, he was a, he was a, a chef an expert meat cutter and, uh, mm. and he was also a, a bartender and he figured that he would buy this one place it would like uh cater to all of his talents right and and then he had a piano and i think he had an organ in as well and mm. uh, so he uh so he would sing like every night you know as, as part of the deal and, and oh, wow. he, come, he actually had a following the club stayed open i don't know at least three or four years be longer but yeah they were kind of a for a while and, and uh, that was yeah, like a really gigs there that was like a jazz trio, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was with Dan and it was either Louis or Durf, I suppose. Right, right. Uh, at the time, I, I don't remember. Sadly, I mean, I'm going to say I don't remember a lot. And, no, that's, I mean, and, and to be honest with you, I don't remember. I mean, everybody mentions Durf just because Durf's been in so many different bands and Durf may have told me about playing in there too. You know, it's been a while since I interviewed him. I see him every month though. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, there... Um, Dan McNamara thought you may have played at the Village Dinner Theater. Um, oh, yeah. Like uh, that was run by Larry Moss of the Playhouse. Yeah, Larry. So have you talked to Larry? No, no. It was the first I'd heard his name when Dan told me about him. Yeah. So Larry is really, um, he was a student at prep. He was like, I think the year ahead of me. And mm. way more so than, like I said, like Tony or Father Bible. Uh, Larry was like a musical force of nature, uh, so ahead of his time. He was a, a very talented pianist. He could read very well, and he, he loved music, really into music theater. 
And I, I remember in Dan's podcast, you talked you talked about uh, Alice Through the Looking. Mm, mm-hmm. So yeah. that was actually my first orchestration game. Oh, okay. Because I was playing on it too. I can't remember if I was, I think I was playing woodwind clarinet and sax. Um, but but Larry um, actually, I don't know why he thought I could do it, but he actually gave me a bunch of charts to orchestra because the original music they got was very skeletal. They, they didn't have the, they just had like, Mm. And so the music uh, had to be orchestrated from them, uh, which I did. I, I, I'm sure I did a horrible job, <laughs> but I know they ended up using the orchestrations anyway. But but Larry was responsible for that. He was also a director at at least one and probably more dinner theaters around the time. Okay. I'm pretty sure there was one. So I did uh, several shows. And And what was a dinner theater at that time? Well, they still exist, but they're a dying breed. It's essentially you, uh, you know, a combination dinner and theater experience. So the uh, you, you go in and you order dinner and all the actors are actually your waiters. Okay, yeah. All right, <laughs> yeah. You serve dinner and, uh, and then shortly after that, every, the waiters disappear and then they go get dressed for the show and they, they put on a show. Got it. But, uh, you know, I, that, that, what you said was the West End? Um, for, for that, yeah, he said it was at the Village Dinner Theater. The Village Dinner Theater. Yeah. yeah they actually put on quality stuff. And, and I have to uh, give Larry props for that. Because you know, for, for a guy who was like just a junior and senior in high school, he was like hmm. really doing professional level stuff. Yeah. Ahead of the rest of So uh, he was kind of an inspiration to me. Uh, and as I said, he gave me my first orchestration. It was great. I mean, there's a particular kind of thrill that you get when you hear, you know, uh, an, an ensemble events playing stuff that you wrote. And yeah. That was my kind of my first taste of that. Well, uh, Dale, too. Dale Higgins is another guy really deserves like a kind of a plaque or, 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 or a bust or something for all of the musicians that he uh, nurtured under. Him. He was mm. the first guy to get me to write big band charts. And again, he was like very patient. I remember the first chart I wrote for him, horrible. I mean, uh, I don't want to bog things down too much by telling you why why it was horrible. But anyway, he goes, yeah, yeah, why don't you try again next week? And so I wrote another one next week, and I learned from my mistakes. And the, and the next one actually sounded like half deep. And hmm. he was also the first guy who got me to improvise piano. Oh, okay. Was, you know, I had only taken classical lessons, and I, I knew a little, somehow I knew about chords. Hmm. And uh, But uh, it, we, we were playing some tune, and I'm playing piano, I'm just playing the chords. He goes, Dave, take it! And I go, what do you mean, take it? Take what? <laughs> he goes, play! And I just played some random bullshit, and somehow a few bars of it sounded okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like a little bit of a thrill. Hey, these two bars didn't sound completely awful. And, uh, and that also kind of planted a seed. So, you know, uh, it's funny, after I moved out of Erie, kind of Erie was in like the rear view mirror for me because there's, there's a lot going on in Washington. I, you know, sure, I'm yeah. a busy musician here. But when I look back on it, I mean, all the moments musically for me really happened in yeah uh between you know meeting like the guys we've already talked to turning me on to different musics playing in different bands and really you know i was lucky to achieve a wide variety of experiences in the area and as you know as we were saying you know i mentioned we backtracking at the time i'm not sure if this was happening all over america maybe it was just like a really exciting right. time for music you know the end of the 70s uh you know had, had taken a lot of transformation going on and i remember when you are the sunshine of my life, number one on the top radio. I go, hey, that sounds like a jazz. And then <laughs> Deodato's 2001, you probably don't read, but uh, those were, you know, they were just different experiences. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, Erie, I don't think is really thought of necessarily as like a, a crucible of, uh, of cultural awareness or anything, but really, <laughs> It kind of was. There was a lot going on. Yeah. There was a lot going on. And, and, a, and a, a fair amount of really talented people in there at the same time. I mean, maybe the, the talented people stays consistent through the years and you just think, well, the guys you know were. The right, people. right. It did seem like, well, like John Novello was in sure. town. So uh, John Novello had an effect on me. I, I'd never met him personally. Maybe I met him once, but he, he played with uh, CJ Bry. Yeah at prep and they did um they did roundabout by yes mm -hmm. and i was sitting there going what the i was totally <laughs> blown away i this it was probably <laughs> blew away the last remnants of my my uh, snobbery because <laughs> i could tell that what they were doing required some serious musicianship yeah 
you yeah. mentioned Larry Moss and you said, you know, he was like a force of nature. You know, he was pushing out, you know, he was doing original things and everything. And yeah. you also played in, in another one of those large orchestra types of events in April of 72, you play in Godspeed. Um, oh, that's right. And that was an original oratorio. How did you find that? I just find stuff. I do. Wow. And Bill Neely composed that largely. Yeah. Um, and it was directed by George Hughes. Again, it was like one of those things that, you know, we're going to create this thing. And this was a giant, I mean, for the time, it was a, a what you would call a big band. There were a lot of people in that. And yeah. Chris, Christine was in that band as a cellist, yeah, Chris, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Chris and I also played in the junior Phil along yeah. with him and also yeah. uh, Cindy Wagner. Was okay. Band. Yeah, that was like a that was a decent orchestra. But I, I think that's where I met Chris. Uh, Chris and I hung out a lot. Yeah, this one we didn't do a, remember doing a lot of playing. Uh, we were just like pals and yeah. uh, kicked around together. She was like the same kind of weirdness as I was at the time, or whatever. <laughs> she, I mean, she was the first person I interviewed for this uh, podcast. She's episode number one, and you know there was a reason for that. I mean, she was quite a force of her own. Um, yeah. She developed the moniker of X Teen, and um, you know was involved in so many original bands and in the Generic Beat, which a big, which was a big band in, um, or a very popular band, I should say, not a big band um in the punk scene and the new wave time yeah. and you know she was a force you know so oh, yeah she's imagine. she's I mean, been great she's like uh she was totally non-conformist back yeah then. even though she was playing you know classical music and the eerie phil the yeah film, she was not your your typical uh you know <laughs> mild-mannered uh classical cellist at all. right <laughs> well she said when she was in godspeed um she was only a teenager you know at the time yeah. so yeah yeah. At Godspeed, I, I remember we played in Buffalo and we got snowed in uh, before we could get home. And we had to sleep <laughs> on the floor of a church someplace <laughs> up in Buffalo with that. There was a lot of people in Godspeed. It was a big production. It was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bill, is it Bill McNeely? Uh, just Neely. Yeah. Bill, Bill Neely. Neely. Yeah. I, I remember him. Yeah. He was a he was an, another energetic guy. Have you talked to him at all? Is he no, but his name has popped up before. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah, sure. the other eerie name I should mention too, uh, and I was so saddened to hear of his passing was Ed Poo. Yeah, just a few months ago. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Uh, I was very sad. Yeah, Ed and I played together probably over about a. Year. This was during Ed Zappo phase. Did oh, nice. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So he was like so into Zappa. <laughs> uh, in fact, he he looked like Zappa. He had like he grew like the same mustache and, and yeah. Everything. Is very funny. Only wore black clothes, uh, but he was a good guy and, and a very creative guy too. Yeah, yeah. And Nobody went on to a doing Zappa in town, and he was right. We were we we're actually rehearsing. I don't remember that we ever did a gig, but we rehearsed like all the time. So it's kind of the nature of like a lot of bands. You sure, know? sure, yeah. I, in fact, I know that he played with Durf for a while, uh, and they did some Zappa stuff uh, in um, one of their bands. I think Keith Vasheko was in that band too. And uh, but yeah, um, he was a big fan of Zappa for sure. Yeah. Uh, so I was going to say when you talked about sleeping on the floor in the church, you know, I mean, you did you know, your fair share of traveling around, like you said, when you were with Patty Short and that band, you traveled around and everything. I mean, were there some crazy road stories that you remember from back then thinking, you know, this is just how it is? Um, or did you transition into the jazz and classical world, which I don't envision as having the same problems as playing bar gigs? Um, am I am I wrong? You know? Um, no, you're not wrong. I mean, uh yeah, there's, there's generally have a better class of venue on average yeah. <laughs> on a classical gig. It's not to say there aren't hellish classical gigs, but uh, um, yeah, there, I don't remember anything really standing out um, as far as stories, at least when I was eerie. Okay. In terms of, I have some from, from later, but. Yeah, I mean, we can, because we're at the point now where you've moved on, you know, from se yeah. in 75. And so you're still young. You're in your 20s. Yeah. And so and I moved to, to and you know at that time disco was really big and live bands were really big. So when I moved to DC, I all of a sudden I'm working six nights a week steady mm. uh, with like disco bands. You know, I, I still have this hideous jumpsuit somewhere 
in my closet. It's like the menstrual orange color. It's like, why on earth did we pick this? Up? Those are the pictures that you need to send me. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, well, I, <laughs> I purposely avoided those ones. Yeah. Uh, but then, like, then the bottom dropped. I, I guess it's when, um, like, when DJs started to come in. Sure. And, right. like, overnight, man. I, you know, w- when I moved to D- to D.C., I was, you know, like every hotel, like every Holiday Inn, Ramada Inn, um, they all had like a lounge and they all had a live band like mm-hmm. six or seven nights. A week. And it was ridiculous. So many musicians were working. And I would say over the course of a year or so, all of that just went away. Mm. Wow. Uh, but uh, in a way, that was great because I, I really, I didn't mind playing that music, but, you know, when you're playing it that much, some of the some of the stuff can get, anything get can get tedious when you're doing it that long. So sure, sure. Um, so then I, you know I, I, the bottom dropped out, and I'm like impoverished. But then I got a gig with uh, uh, Ricky Lotza, and she's I forget the name of the band now, but it was it was a Latin band, and um, I didn't know anything about Latin music, but it was the only gig I had, and it, but it was great because it was three three nights a week. It paid my bills and just about that and not, yeah. not much more. And the rest of the time I spent practice. Before that point, I wasn't doing, well, I guess I was practicing ever since. Somehow I had managed to do all the stuff in Erie without doing a lot of practice. <laughs> I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but uh, I, I really got serious about it after I moved. And uh, and then the, the economy started, you know, I, I just fell into uh, studio work, which is how I got all the classical. Mm. Uh, some piano player didn't show up for a studio date. They called me at the last minute and I read the stuff and apparently they were impressed. And it turned out the guitar player who was the composer was also uh, the resident guitar player in the opera house of the Kennedys. And so it just turned out at that time they needed a keyboard player at the Kennedys. So hmm. I ended up playing piano in the opera house. did that for, well, until probably 90. And then, then I started working with the National Symphony. It was all... Where- you know, I think probably lots of musicians probably have stories like this where you don't really plan any of this. It's just like right. being in the right place at the right time and something happens. So those pictures that I see of you with uh, President Bush or the yeah. President's Bush is at the Kennedy Center? Uh, no, that was at the White House. Oh, uh, so of I course. Had actually, I had actually done some uh, ch- some charity work for Neil Bush. Neil Bush has a uh, educational foundation. So I actually played piano for him for free. I... I I just did it because, well, I like, it was my contribution to charity. You know, I thought as much as I had uh, mixed thoughts about the, the Bush family and their politics and stuff, I knew he was doing something positive. Yeah. So anyway, I was surprised, uh, you know, after I did a couple of these gigs, uh, they gave me an invitation to the White House as part of a party. I remember uh, fighting over the dip with Colin Powell. <laughs> Get out of my way. Oh, oh sorry, General. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How do you, um, and uh, I think Art had mentioned to me that you've done a lot of music scoring for National Geographic. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I did that for about 20, 25 years. Oh, okay. Um, and wh- what yeah, is so, that? Is it for the documentaries that they produce or what? Yeah, I did a bunch of the, the National Geographic specials. Um, a couple of them were uh, were actually ghost written. Uh, there was one called "The Power of Water." It was uh, this is back when National Geographic specials were kind of like a big deal. Yeah, right, you know, right. I don't know if you remember that, but yeah. you know, it's like people, hey, this National Geographic special going to be on next week, you know? Uh, right. Well, they started doing more and more of those, and it became less special. But this is probably one of the tail end of when it was still special. But right. It was, uh, another composer had written it. Uh, or, uh, actually, other composer had hired me to do it but wanted his name on there. He did do some of the music, but I also did. And then after that, I was uh, working for the channel, but I also did uh, also the special, the special. Mm. Then I worked for the Smithsonian channel for a couple of years. And then, you know, the odd just uh, document would, pop, would come across my desk. I did that for quite a while, uh, but it was a real grind, especially mm. when I was doing um, when I was doing the weekly shows. The Geographic channel was weekly shows often, and the Smithsonian stuff was too. So you had to compose and play. In that period yeah. well wow. yeah i mean i basically had to do everything i you know, on occasion i would have to hire an outside musician studio here yeah do something more real but their, their budget sucked so bad that i really couldn't i couldn't afford to do that very often uh but you know synthesizers and, and samples and stuff got much better during became got it. less necessary to produce uh you know professional level product be happy with, just using my resources but you know i would get the the tape on monday and then I would have to write 20 minutes worth, uh, by Friday. 
they would listen to it on Saturday. And, uh, and if I had to do any rewrites, I'd do it Saturday night and then it would go to production on Sunday and then wow. it would start over again. And, uh, hmm. you know, just that constant pressure. Plus yeah. I have two little kids, I've got little girls, I was trying to raise the time. It was a crazy period, super crazy. <laughs> Plus I was still doing gigs. You know? I was going to say, were you still playing live? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, you know, up until recently now I'm retired, but up until that point, I was the boy who would always say, yeah. If there was a space on my calendar, sure, I'll do it. What are yeah. the conditions? I don't care. I'm doing it. So <laughs> got me into trouble sometimes. So today you're what, sixty-eight years old? I am sixty-eight, yes. Uh you're retired. Um, what does retirement entail these days for Dave Kane? Well, it's really it all it entails is me doing exactly what I want to do and not doing anything I don't want to do. Okay. That's the only difference. I haven't slowed down. In fact, no intention until, until, you know, life has other plans for me. Sure. Uh, because is it more live stuff or is it still a lot of well, recording jazz with my own trio f uh, four nights a week? Oh, okay. In wow. In DC. Nice. And, uh, and I have playing with some of the best music. Fantastic. I look forward to work every night. And uh, I teach at the University of uh, the Masters of Art. And uh, I'm also, well, I'm just about to uh, release my second book, first book, too. Kind of a minor hit. It's a niche product aimed at a niche audience, but it apparently it did well. So uh, On ear training, right? Well, the, or, the new one is on ear training. Yeah. yeah. The first one was on uh, improv design. That's the, well, what encouraged me to do the second. How do you teach the class at University of Arkansas all over Zoom or? Uh, mostly through Zoom. Okay. Um, but I, I'm actually going to go down there in about two the summer session. Cool. And, uh, occasionally, I, I, I will drop in in the middle of the year, depending on... What do you teach there? I, I teach um, uh, improvisation, jazz composition, piano, and jazz piano. Okay. All right. Uh, hmm. But so, sometimes I don't have students for, for one... Well, I'm always teaching improvisation and jazz piano, but sometimes I don't have... Got That's it. I'm busy enough. Do you ever get back to Erie? Um, I have been back to Erie a couple of times. Um, I haven't, haven't been there in a while. Probably the last time was about four or five years ago. I was playing at Chautauqua mm. uh, and, uh, decided just to take a, a jaunt in the, uh, yeah. remember stuff that it was, it was remarkable to me how, how little had changed. I mean, some things had, had definitely changed. Sure. Right. Uh, right. You know, I used to live in Wesleyville and it, it looked more or less the same as I remember. It, it does. Yeah. 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 I'm uh, very close to that right so. now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, Erie has a fond place in my heart. As I said, you know, for years I didn't think about it that much, just being a young person and trying to be forward thinking. But now I'm like really grateful to the music experiences that I had there and the Pimet. Uh, and that's really basically why I contacted him. Yeah. He was some of these names like Frank and Dale and Ray Passanelli and Larry were all really kind of important people uh, in Erie in, to a certain degree. Uh, you know, they weren't working in rock bands necessarily, but right. they are part of right. the Erie's musical history. And as, as you know, from talking to me and Dan and, and Art, like there's definitely a percolation going on. Yeah. I didn't tell you that I actually was supposed to play with the younger brother. Mm. And, uh, but what happened was for some reason I, I auditioned for and I got the audition and then they said, show up next week for a rehearsal. And I showed up the following week and I brought my Fender Rhodes with me because that was my keyboard instrument at the time. And one, I can't remember who it was that he said, well, wait a minute, we thought you were an organist. And I said, I don't have an organ. And they said, well, sorry, <laughs> you need an organist. So I, I got fired on the spot. Yeah, like, before he even started, yeah. 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 So yeah. anyway, that was the, one of the guys had mentioned the younger brothers and I totally forgotten them in that. Or, oh yeah. Yeah. Until, until I heard that. So, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you reached out and this was a good, uh, walk through, uh, memory lane, I guess for you. And, uh, a lot of the yeah. folks still remember you from those 10 years that you were here. So I appreciate you sharing that and your stories with us today. That was well, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chip. And, and on behalf of everybody, you know, who's interested in musical history, thank you for doing what you're doing. It's a, it's a valuable. I really enjoyed listening to the podcast. I've, I've got a bunch more to listen to. I haven't got to. I will be getting to them. And I'll have a lot more coming up. So I appreciate that. Great. Thanks. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode of the Erie Music History Podcast. I want to say thanks to the JPT Foundation. They have been a financial supporter of the podcast since the beginning. And they also give us a free space to have our monthly music night on the first Tuesday of the month. 
It always features our great house band, The Fabulous Leftovers, as well as a lot of other local bands and musicians. Sometimes it's a basic open mic after that, but it's a lot of fun. First Tuesday of the month, totally free. Any donations go to the Second Harvest Food Bank. It is BYOB. Uh, You can bring in alcohol, drinks, whatever you'd like. There's a great pizza shop next door, Paso Linquas. Uh, There's a subway in the plaza, so check that out the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, Aside from the JPT Foundation, I want to thank Angelo Phillips, who has been a financial supporter of the podcast for the past couple months. Angelo is a great local musician who I will be happy to play with. Next year, we're going to play a few gigs together, so looking forward to that. Also, make sure that you check out Jack Stevenson's Two Man Happy Hour podcast. Basically tells you where people are playing today, um, where and when, and uh, you can check that out at the number two manhappyhour.com. Check that out. He also does a weekly podcast with our sound man for the monthly music night, uh, Brian Waller, as well as Nat the Hat. So the three of them do a great podcast where they interview local musicians and they again talk about who is playing where. But more importantly, they play a lot of local music on that. So check that out. That's um, Music Chat with Nat the Hat. And you can find that uh, on Facebook anywhere. All right. That's all I got for you. Thanks again for listening.